Here's a look at some of those times when chefs, you know, came close to getting arrested on Hell's Kitchen. You think I'm joking? Try me. While Ramsey can't stand contestants breaking the rules, did you know that there have been times where he was forced to bend the rules or even change them for good? Talk about a double standard. Well, it is his show, so I guess he can do whatever he wants, but either way you slice it, let's figure out the method behind his madness. Join me as I get to the bottom of how the rules bent and changed as Hell's Kitchen has grown. Now, if you ask me, I think the very first season of Hell's Kitchen was almost like watching a documentary. It was as raw as it gets. They've come from all over the country with varied experience. But that's what made it special, you know? It had its own quirky charm. Back then, we actually got to see Ramsey getting interviewed, and this included a bunch of his confessionals. I wish they continued those. And those contestants, man, they were like regular people who just dabbled in cooking at home. Except for Michael, Ralph, and Chris, of course. As the show progressed into later seasons, almost every contestant had a culinary background. Which, I mean, fair, it definitely leveled the playing field. Season 2 gave us the iconic men versus women format, which continued up until season 18. Stop writing. Ah, ah. Mistake, numero uno. That's when they threw rookies into the ring against the seasoned veterans of the show. Again, in season 21, they went for a fresh twist. They divided the teams into the 20-somethings for the red team and the 40-somethings for the blue team, making it the third time they didn't split the teams by gender. Um, the first time ever on Hell's Kitchen, get ready. Battle of the Ages. Up until season three, we had never seen something like this happen. Why is the risotto on? We haven't got one away. How long's that been on there for? Well, that's Spaghetti King Josh. I'm sure he needs no introduction for us Hell's Kitchen mega fans, but for the rest of you, he was the first contestant to be eliminated mid-service. During the dinner service in episode eight, he was holding down the fort at the appetizer station. He was brimming with confidence, thinking he could kick things off with a bang. But oh boy, Ramsey wasn't planning on letting anything slide that night. He spotted Josh cooking up risotto before any orders even came in. I mean, what was the need for it, my man? Can someone stop this guy? How many risottos are you doing up front? Then he discovered that Josh had cooked spaghetti without any having been ordered yet. Josh tried to play it off as a mistake, but come on, you and I both know Ramsey wouldn't be having any of that. Dirtiest, scummiest Italian restaurant in Venice Beach. Cook spaghetti to order, you donkey. Don't laugh, you guys. Maybe he goes to the Church of the Flying Spaghetti Monster. Show some respect to the Pastafarians. Anyway, we have to give him a lot of credit for the way he handled his elimination. Ramsey was losing his temper with how much Josh was screwing up. On top of all of that, his risotto came back undercooked. The rice grains were probably as hard as the nail driven into his coffin, right? Give me the jacket. Give me, Give me the, the jacket. You so as shit. Josh's mid-service elimination might have been shocking, but it was honestly pretty tame compared to what had come in the future. Even crazier scenes have unfolded in the heat of service, with every elimination being more jaw-dropping than the last. Sometimes, in the heat of the moment, contestants end up doing some bad shit crazy stuff. I'm talking about things that nobody could have seen coming. And what better way than to start with someone who, he knows who he is, and he ain't nobody's bitch. And in case you don't know who I'm talking about, watch this. Fuck the cameras. We just I'm standing here. And then you want to get all tough and up close and personal. It's been more than a decade since this cute little interaction, and it's still as entertaining as the day it dropped. Here are some facts we know about Joseph. One, he was hungry for the prize, like a dog who has taken off his leash. His words, not mine. And two, he was not an animal, as he would not eat with his bare hands. And three, he was leagues ahead of Gordon Ramsay. Yeah, he sure as hell didn't need his guidance, right guys? So, in all honesty, Ramsay was being very kind when he asked Joseph to do a simple task during the deliberations, which was to name the first nominee and explain why. But Joseph, our resident rebel without a cause, had other ideas. He argued that his teammates could speak for themselves. And, well, Ramsey didn't appreciate the, oh, what's the word, wisdom of this response. A smart ass. I asked you to tell me, who's the first nominee 
And why? But he was just getting started. When asked again, Joseph begrudgingly named Tony and Andy as the nominees, but couldn't resist adding that they knew why. Now that was a mild understatement, really. I know you may be slightly sh the third time around, Joseph started to confront Ramsey, asserting that they chose as a group and didn't need any peer pressure because they were all men. I ain't no f I don't give a f What? Yeah, Gordon, we all had the exact same reaction. Like, why did he flip out so suddenly? Why was he so triggered over that one simple question? Now, this is where things get interesting. Joseph decided to take on fellow contestants, hurling insults left and right, telling Robert, Ariel, Suzanne, and Tech to do this. Shut your mouth. What did she do right now? Then, in a fit of dramatic flair, he dramatically removed his jacket, tossed it to the ground, and stormed menacingly towards Ramsey. You want a jacket? You want to talk? Let's go step outside. I ain't here for that, dog. Dude set the bar so low that he tripped on it on his way out. Watch the step. But that was not the end of it. In his charming exit interview, Joseph continued his streak of insults, showing us all what it means to go out with a bang. I don't need some limey <laughs> prick. But you know what? For me personally, this was the most badass Ramsey moment ever. Total, total shame. Notice how smoothly he kicked Joseph's jacket up from the floor and onto the table, all while keeping his hands in his pockets? Smooth, right? Well, that's the soccer player in him. Take Lacey from season five. She stumbled through service like a bull in a china shop. What are we gonna get for the beef, guys? Guys, guys. Then there's Louis from season six, Nilka from season seven, and let's not forget Jen from season 18. You see, Josh getting the axe was but a harbinger for wave after wave of mid-service eliminations. If you've been following the show for a long time, you know when Ramsey reaches his wit's end, there's no coming back from it. And these chefs, despite being given countless chances, just kept fumbling the ball. Some were downright disastrous and honestly had me wondering if they even belonged in the kitchen in the first place. Others clung to their delusions until the bitter end. You can't help but get sucked into the suspense and wonder whether they'd sink or swim. And mid-service eliminations, trust me, they're more than justified when they send their whole crew overboard. Do you remember when this happened? Oh no, chef! No good enough! Get out! You're not good enough! Piss off! And well, that's reality TV for ya. Tension, surprises, and the unrelenting pursuit of excellence, even when the heat is on. Now, Ralph from season one was the first contestant to be nominated by Ramsey himself, but he ended up being the runner-up of the season. Yep. After getting a scare of a lifetime, dude must have gotten his act together real quick. But this next contestant set a new precedent by being the first one to be eliminated by Ramsey despite not being nominated by his team. Gabe. After a terrible service, the blue team lost and they nominated Giacomo and Tom for elimination. But like you just saw, Ramsey wasn't convinced that either of them were the right fit. Instead, he opted to send Gabe back home for his lack of passion. Like he was barely able to handle his own station. You're a sweet guy, but sweet guys don't make great cooks. Take off your jacket. Like you already know, after every service, Ramsey would gather the losing team or teams, we'll get there, and introduce the nomination ritual. In the first four seasons, he'd pick a best of the worst from the losing team, giving them the special duty of nominating who should lead. Now that we all want to slam our heads into a wall, we need tough competition to follow it up. And I can't think of anyone better for that job than Jackie. There are two important things you should know about her right away. I'm tough, I'm beautiful, I'm sexy, I will kick your ass and <laughs> all in the same time. You see, before the fourth dinner service, she renamed the prep list to this. I'm gonna put the <laughs> list. Yeah, if you missed it in the video, here's a closer look. Classy, right? But sadly for her, that wasn't gonna fly. Sous chef Christina Wilson, absolutely destroyed her. Like, absolutely no holds barred. Never again, I swear to God. Shut up! 
She did not think that was very funny. Nobody did, Jackie. She really didn't stand a chance. I mean, she was up against the same chef who survived season 10's notorious red team. If any of this happens in this kitchen again, whoever writes it will be finishing the f list. Take a seat, have a seat and sit down. Just sit down. I mean, that's Gordon's protege right there. You can see he trained her right. She was not gonna take that disrespect. She sent Jackie to the chef's table, made it clear that she'd have fired her had this happened in her kitchen, but even still, someone seemed to have not outgrown her angsty teenage phase. It's a professional kitchen. You wanna have it? Oh, you don't care? No, no. You don't care? No, no. Literally a rebel without a cause. Remember how Christina Wilson identified Robin as the cancer in her team during her season? She bestowed the same title on Jackie this time around. Find the cancer in your team and work around it. Later, during their break, Jackie tried to justify what she had done by saying she's a jokey person who gets serious during service, but that her humor just kind of went over our heads. I'm the type of person that where I could joke, 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 and then boom, jump into service and get done. But these morons don't see that. To be fair, you need to have a very high IQ to understand Jackie's comedy. <laughs> well, she was good at one thing, though which was constantly provoking her teammates. You know what I should be doing? Breaking your face right now. But what was absolutely horrifying was the heated exchange in the 10th episode when Jackie decided to mock Kristen, questioning how it felt to be working on the same level as someone who had just started cooking. Kristen, not one to back down, fired back by stating that Jackie had no clue what she was doing either, despite her three months of experience. She didn't mince her words when she added that she saw right through Jackie's facade. You've only been cooking three months. You don't know what the f you're doing. Everything about you is a sack of f Things escalated further when Kristen refused to give Jackie a lighter. But she snatched it from Kristen and taunted her, challenging her to make good on her threat. This tense standoff reached its peak when Jackie threw Kristen's lighter to the ground, pushing Kristen's patience to the limit. Jackie, Punch me in the face. Jackie, give me my Punch lighter. me in the face. Either light your cigarette, give me my lighter. Like you saw, Jackie persistently kept taunting Kristen to hit her, and even going as far as to dump the ashtray on her. God, that's absolutely vile. Kristen eventually reached her breaking point, declaring that she'd had enough, and left the patio. High time, right? But Jackie wasn't through with her. Guy, put your hands on me. Get the out of my face. Put your hands on me, Are you serious? Get Assault should have been grounds for immediate disqualification. Like, I'm not crazy for thinking that, right? Anybody want to play devil's advocate? Probably not. After she confessed that it was her strategy to manipulate Kristen. It's a game now, and it is to f with your mind. Oh, boy. Mind games stem from a place of immaturity and insecurity. But I'm not surprised given that Jackie was deceptive from day one. Now, this next contestant seemed to derive some kind of strange, sadistic pleasure seeing her own team fail. Heather, do you understand that? Yes, it's her bloody call. Yes, chef. I couldn't have graduated culinary school without making risotto. Yeah, so how about that now? I mean, will you look at that evil grin? She got a kick out of it. She was such an asshole to Heather. Quick question. What's an appropriate reaction for a decent human being when they hear that one of their coworkers has been hospitalized? Empathy? Concern? Oh, definitely not this, right? Larry, she's gone. This is another step closer I get to that win, so see you later, alligator. This is her reacting to the news of Larry's departure from the competition after facing severe breathing difficulties. Quite rightly, one of the viewers called her a complete roiling hot sack of horse turd. <laughs> ha! Oh, so creative. Gordon might want to use that in the future. Now, in the fourth service, Sarah was stationed at the fish station, and right off the bat, she failed at communication with Rachel. When Rachel was ready to plate her first appetizer, Sarah's lack of response annoyed Rachel to no end. She had to call out for help three times before Sarah finally decided to acknowledge her existence. But wait, there's more. When Virginia inquired if Sarah was ready with her turbot, Sarah assured her that she was good to go. Virginia, trusting her word, sent her Wellingtons to the pass. But guess what happened? Is it, I haven't fired it yet. She said that she's ready. No. She didn't even start cooking it. Yeah, Sarah hadn't even started cooking the turbot. Now, that's some next level sabotage right there. She did start cooking it, chef. 
So now you want to start lying to me. I'm not lying to you, Chef. Virginia, who was berated by Ramsay to no fault of her own, was understandably annoyed about Sarah's little act of treachery. Did I misunderstand you when I heard you say you were ready for whenever I am? Um, it was tortellini. I didn't hear turbo. What a bad liar. No guilt, no remorse. Chef Ramsay can't stand you right now. I don't necessarily see that as such a bad thing. Ugh, can't stand her shit-eating grin. And get this, back in 2013, she was arrested for allegedly assaulting her boyfriend. Yeah, real winner right there. Starting from season five, the whole team joined in the nominations, with Ramsey rarely using the best of the worst title unless someone truly shone above the rest. Like this one. You. Go back up to the dorm and come up with one of your teammates. Season 2, episode 4 was the first time Ramsey named both teams joint losers. And as they say, you can't put the genie back into the bottle. Both teams losing became more common than Ramsey probably would have wanted after that point. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. yeah, there you go. I've had enough. Embarrassing? Yes. True? Also yes. By the way, seasons 10, 11, and 12 are tied for having the most joint service losses, each with six to their name. That being said, winning a dinner service might sound like a relief. After all, you're safe from elimination, right? Well, yes, but actually no. Ramsey won't hesitate to give the boot to someone from the winning team if their performance sucks enough. And so long as we're talking about firsts, here's the first time that happened. Carol, and you're leaving Hell's Kitchen. Was it justified? I mean, after showing you what I've got to show you, I'm sure we'll be on the same page. You see, Carol was at the meat station. Her star player, the Gratin Dauphina, was on the menu as a side for the red team's halibut. But as I'm sure you've probably guessed by now, when she brought them up... Fucking hell. Why are the potatoes crunchy? Yeah, no, Ramsey wasn't having it. So much, in fact, that he made the whole red team taste the disaster. Meanwhile, Carol tried to explain she thought Andrea needed to oven bake them before the orders came in. But Ramsey decided to give her a quick lesson about that. Ramsey wanted a timeline, and Carol took a shot in the dark and guessed that she needed 10 minutes. Maybe 10 minutes, everybody, of Gretchen Dauphinoise. Look at them! What else could go wrong, right? Well, apparently a lot. Look, medium, and it comes out mid rare Look at me. Stop what you're doing. Welp. Not exactly what she was expecting, huh? And like the rest of these first, the winning team potentially having someone eliminated didn't stop after Carol's surprise exit. Nowhere to hide anymore, you guys. Season 7 was a prime example, when, despite the blue team's victory, Ramsey showed Salvatore the door. Your time has run out. Yes, sir. I mean, Salvatore's days were definitely numbered, with him managing just one standout service out of the seven so far. He even confessed to feeling lost, admitting he often held back to avoid Ramsey's wrath. And hey, not like Salvatore was on top of his game to begin with. The dude had a ton of mistakes under his belt. Like, he missed a chicken garnish order and even set a pan on fire. Oh, now it's on fire. Come on, Salvatore! <laughs> Honestly, Ramsey probably just put Salvatore out of his misery as far as the competition was concerned. And then came season 8, which brought us the infamous Raj. Again, dude needs no introduction, but he's also joined the club. Get your ass over here. And it kept going. Jeremy Madden in season 11, Randy Bell in season 14, Joe Ricci in season 15, Jia Young in season 16, and Ben Walenka from season 17. All of them fell despite theoretically being safe. Now for something a little more subtle. Take your jacket off and go back to your daughter. Did you notice what was unusual about it? Well, when it came down to the nominations, Corey had her sights set on Roseanne as her second pick, following Matt as her first. Ramsey then summoned them along with Christina, who he nominated himself. At first, Ramsey did this. Back in line. Whew, close call. 
Well, not so fast. He quickly did a 180 and decided to show her the door despite sending her back in line. Now, I mean, I get it. The writing was on the wall. Her lack of organization and innumerable blunders had probably sealed her fate in Ramsey's eyes. But imagine the whiplash Roseanne must have felt. But while she was at least given the opportunity to make her case, this chef wasn't even afforded that much. Melissa, step forward. When it was time for the elimination round, Ramsey didn't sit around twiddling his thumbs, waiting for the blue team to announce their picks. He straight up called Melissa down and immediately sent her packing, citing her declining performances, lack of improvement despite being given a shot at redemption by joining the blue team, and above all, the fact that she had been given way too many chances already. During the dinner service that night, her scallops were paper thin, her risotto was overcooked, and so was her monkfish. It looks like regurgitated dog Where's the other monkfish gone? I have one yes, left, chef. chef. Yeah, that would do it. I mean, if I ruined half the food in one of Ramsey's kitchens, I'd be a mile away before the man caught wind of it. Better that than facing his wrath. Yikes. Speaking of facing Ramsey's wrath, do you remember this? Take off your jacket and leave House Kitchen. Tennille was the first contestant to be eliminated during the post-mortem. The guy didn't even bother asking for nominations. Now, Tennille was tasked with handling the fish station that night. When Ramsay called for scallops, her response was to send up the rubberiest one she could muster, which Ramsay immediately figured out. Two portions of scallops, they're rubbery, they're blonde, rubber band. Oh, with a comparison like that, you know it's gotta be real bad. With no margin for error left, she managed to squeak out a win after refiring them, but Ramsey made clear that she was on thin ice. But thin ice is always gonna break sooner or later, and in her case, the sea bass she sent up included a burnt portion and a raw halibut. That ice was cracking right under her feet. As he uncovered more and more rejected items at her station, his frustration peaked. You can't go back! You're telling us a time to know, then you're naked yes, all the chef. time! Her mishandled sea bass brought the kitchen to a halt, leaving diners waiting for their main courses. Now, the ice was probably long broken by then, and her fate already sealed. But the blunders continued. Her second attempt at halibut ended up raw again. Though she adamantly asserted that it wasn't intentional, like that was going to help anything. Amidst the chaos of timing requests, she left the team hanging, offering two minutes to Dave and Ariel, but then declaring she needed an additional six minutes when Ramsey came knocking. Dave had no choice but to move on to the lamb. As tensions escalated, Ramsey pulled Tennille aside into the pantry for a conversation. You're not even talking to the team, Tennille! I am talking to him, I'm Try. Frank Bellotti and Sterling Wright were also eliminated during the postmortem in season 13. And let me tell you, tons of fans weren't too happy with it. Now, let's fast forward to Hell's Kitchen season 19. Ramsey was searching for something extra special from the chefs who wanted a shot at his Lake Tahoe restaurant. You know, after all those seasons, you'd think that these contestants would have the competition figured out, right? Well, yeah, unless Ramsey revealed a huge twist on the very first day during the signature dish challenge. Oh, but he'd never do that, right? And I am changing things up. Oh boy. You are not gonna be making your signature dishes. Well, if you thought that, then you've learned absolutely nothing from this list. Ramsey had bigger dreams for Hell's Kitchen season 19. He wasn't into watching rehearsed acts anymore, you know? He was after some real deal, unscripted culinary brilliance. One chef from the red team and one chef from the blue team will go head to head tonight. So they had to work with the stuff they pulled from the slot machine, protein, veggies, and starch. With their ingredients in hand, they had 45 minutes to whip up their signature dishes. Ramsey made sure they knew that this was their very first team challenge and before he even took a bite, he let them in on how he was gonna judge it. He was gonna rate each dish on a scale of one to five, and the team with the most points at the end would take the win. Kicking things off, we had Nikki and Declan in the ring. Ramsey was curious what fueled Nikki's fire. Turns out, Nikki used to be a brain injury specialist, but then she pivoted to the kitchen as a side gig. Eventually though, she left her old job in the dust and fully chased her culinary dreams, and, 
This is what Nikki had to offer. Char-grilled New York strip with a Mexican street corn couscous. And oh, look at this. Ramsey looked pretty pleased, and trust me, that's a rare sight. Now, this is delicious. That, for me, is a very, very strong fork. Now, let's turn our attention onto Declan. This dude made the move from Dublin to the States four years back and rocked the role of executive chef in Washington. Ramsey, always looking for a good laugh, asked Declan what folks called him. Well, honestly, see it for yourselves. Uh, big D. Big D. Yeah. <laughs> that aside, the dude totally knocked it out of the park. Declan brought the heat with his pan-seared New York strip, paired with Israeli couscous that looked like it walked straight off of a food magazine cover. The cook was on point, and so were the flavors. And Ramsey definitely took notice. He dished out the first perfect five of the night, putting the guys in the lead at five to four. Steak is cooked beautifully. How are you, Jeff? Medium rare, rested well, flavor profile's there. Round two, and Cyan was up next. For the last year, I've been on uh, at sea. I work for major cruise lines, major uh, riverboat companies. She served up a scotch marinated filet mignon with deep fried cauliflower and sweet potato mash. Ramsey dug in, but there was some raw cauliflower bits in those fried bites that honestly ruined the whole experience. You cook on a riverboat, and right now I feel like I'm up shit creek. Sadly, she scored just two. No surprises there, but that's gotta hurt being her first ever challenge. Cody was up next, confident that his dish was going to be the talk of the town. Well, his filet with poached yams and oven-roasted cauliflower might have tasted like a winner, but the plating was anything but. Meanwhile, Lauren, who clearly wasn't Cody's biggest fan, had a good laugh at the mess. This is hilarious, because that kid is so cocky. He's not intimidating to me whatsoever. Ramsey gave Cody three points for the flavors, but knocked a few points off for the messy presentation. But still, it put the guys in the lead again, eight to six. Up next, Kenneth, feeling pretty darn confident himself, started talking about his career, both as a personal chef and as a food service director at a Montessori charter school. Ramsey threw a little shade his way, reminding Kenneth how he finished up with a whole 20 minutes to spare. I'm not looking for the Usain Bolt of cookery. You get all that time for a reason, bro. Coming to his dish, he made pan-seared chicken with eggplant and dewy sausage and orzo, but it didn't quite hit the mark. Ramsey wasn't pleased with the scorched chicken at all. Right now, looking at this chicken, I'm feeling bad for those kids in Philly. Are they still talking to you? Ooh, one point. That's gotta sting. Dude definitely went bust with the hand he got dealt. Now, enter Corey. I marinated the chicken in a little bit of yogurt, gram masala, curry, and some cumin. Now, she had a bird too. And to give you an idea of how good it was, Ramsey called out Kenneth to compare her work to his. Just take your time. Make love to your food. Make love to it. Don't f Yes, sir. Yeah? Yes, sir. <laughs> Hear that, folks? Better take notes. Corey scored a pretty respectable four points, putting the woman ahead at 10 to 9. Now, on to the halibut round. Lauren, self-proclaimed flawless lawless, dished out a pan-seared halibut in a spicy arabiata sauce. Ramsey couldn't deny how well she'd cooked the thing, but he still had a bone to pick with her. But why would you put so much bloody pasta on there? I will huh? not put so much next time, chef. You know, that was in the four stroke five. Get it? Because he, he found a bone in there? <laughs> you know, I'll just move on. So, what was Lauren's score, you ask? Three points. Not the four she hoped for, but still pretty good. Drew stepped up next with his halibut and pesto sauce. And well, Ramsey made him and Lauren taste it. Lauren, what is the one thing that pasta needs? Seasoning. It's always the seasoning. And well, here's how that shook out. Absolutely forgot. Two out of five. Yes, Chef. Thank you, Chef. Thank you. And then Mary Lou, with her blackened salmon and rice pilaf, faced Ramsey next. Seasoning again. And the raw rice on the plate, not a good look. Ramsey even did this. Crunchy. Needless to say, she was pretty embarrassed. Elliot closed out the round with his rice-crusted salmon, but Ramsey wasn't thrilled that he had removed the skin. 
God, I love salmon skin. Should be a crime to serve it naked like that. Like, tell me I'm wrong, you guys. Anyway, a mere two points were all Elliot got, keeping the woman on top with a score of 15 to 13. When it came to the lamb round, Adam's lamb with black garlic polenta looked like it had turned things around for the boys. Cooked to perfection, Ramsey gave it a well-deserved four points. Then there was Jordan with her miso lamb. The taste was spot on, but yeah, something was missing stuck together, but the actual lamb is delicious. Jordan earned three points, and the ladies held a slim lead of 18 to 17. For the next showdown, Peter's Cuban spiced ribeye brought some serious flavor to the table, scoring a solid four points. Amber wasn't far behind, wowing everyone with her balsamic honey and Dijon ribeye. Ramsey was so proud that he even did this. Cook yeah. beautifully. Can you guys see that? Yes, yeah. sir. It's a very, very strong four. Yeah, he showed it to the rest of the contestants. Massive W, Amber. Then we moved on to the scallop round. Gordon's favorite. Fabiola's scallops and coconut cream rice were pretty solid, earning three points. Now, Josh's scallops with braised kale, well, what's the opposite of solid? Burnt it. The bitterness with the burnt. Next up, Brittany had a pan-roasted pork chop with brown butter rosemary based, oozing confidence since she had the chance to lean into her Kentucky roots. But was that confidence well-deserved? So, Brittany, you have a two there. Thank you, chef. Yeah, no, not quite. Then there was Mark with his butter-basted pork chop, and the thing looked juicy from a mile away. No surprise he ran circles around Brittany that round. Well, I've kept the score quiet for a couple of rounds. Were you keeping track? If you thought the men won the round, you'd be right. Now, why were we talking about this again? Oh, rule changes. Right. With this last minute pivot on the usual signature dish challenge, Ramsey managed to spot some really talented chefs who didn't buckle under pressure. And, of course, he left no room to hide for those who couldn't. I really like this twist, and I'm excited to see if they keep it with the upcoming season dropping on September 28th. Many viewers wanted it to be Hell's Kitchen Redemption, a season where the chefs who didn't make it to Black Jackets but still had a lot of untapped potential could return. Well, we're not getting that yet but keep on hoping that it'll happen sometime in the future. Season 22's themed around the American dream, probably to parallel the United Tastes of America theme that MasterChef's got going on. But now, it's time to meet another contestant who was unnecessarily mean and crude towards others. In fact, he took pride in it. I don't know why you even look at me. Like, just stop talking to me for the rest of this season. Thank you. Good. This Redditor thinks that Johnny might genuinely be a sociopath. At the very least, he has some serious mommy issues to sort out. Some of his confessionals made absolutely no sense. Like, what did he mean by this? Who taught her to cook like that? It's really annoying when, like, cute little girls cook really well. Ugh, what a tool. There's no excuse for a grown-ass man to gain emotional satisfaction by humiliating others. I've never dealt with this kind of bullying before, so it's rough. I don't know if they're intimidated or they really don't like me now. For Johnny, though, cruelty is pleasurable, even exciting. So he was willing to put in that extra effort to make someone else suffer. In episode four, he had a new target, Kimberly. He began by calling her voice annoying and eagerly anticipated the moment when he could witness her tears. The exact kind of like stuff I do, I just can't wait to make her cry. All right, rat face. I have a rat face? Go chew on some cheese, rat. He must have thought himself assertive, but in reality, you could stop at the first three letters. Kimberly thankfully deflected his bullying. She stood up to him and was absolutely right in saying this. Why don't you start acting like a gentleman and be respectful to people and stop trying to rip on people because you feel about yourself? Yep, he wanted everyone to cower and submit to his abuse for his perverse gratification. Oh, what a weirdo. Johnny neither had the talent nor skill to back him up. I wonder how he survived so long in the competition. But his elimination was one of the best, most satisfying moments ever. I bet you were laughing too, seeing him struggle to accept his defeat because boy, did he have a meltdown. And for me to be standing here right now, I want to rip out the beautiful hair in my head. Yeah, please do. Next to Johnny, I also loathe Andrew Pierce from this season because he led Heather on while being engaged in real life. Dude was a walking red flag. 
like, hear it from Heather herself. He was single yeah. and supposedly seeking me out. So I'm like, all right, well, I'm going to do my homework through social media before I do that. And I'm glad I did because here he was dating a woman and she was all over his Instagram and he ended up having a child with her. <laughs> and I'm like, thank God I dodged that bullet because I would have ended up stuck with that man for the rest of my life. What's worse is that she was made to look like the other woman and was subjected to nasty comments online. Damn, Andrew, you give love a bad name. Next up, we have the weirdest guy from the show. And trust me, I call him weird with good reason. I guess the inspiration from that came from the fact that I've raised and butchered them all. I to eat them raw. I don't know if the producers use those sound effects to make him look that way on purpose, but he gives his answer with the blankest stare. And it doesn't exactly help his case. Now, in the second service, things got even weirder. It all started when his mashed potatoes got sent back for being too runny. Now, instead of addressing the issue in a straightforward manner, Andrew decided to take the batch and mix it with a fresh one he was preparing. Ramsey, as you can imagine, was far from pleased with this approach. When Ramsey attempted to explain why this was a big no-no, Andrew talked back and actually insisted that his idea was brilliant. So we're serving liquid mashed potatoes. So I expect you to that fresh stuff in a pan and you add the liquid to it. Uh-oh. We know that look. Ramsey, reaching the end of his rope, made it clear that he was losing his temper. But Andrew, perhaps immune to social cues, continued to talk back. This landed him a one-way ticket out of the kitchen. You don't care, you got no respect, and you know what? You joke to the industry. Yeah, that's what you are. And here's where the situation takes an even more peculiar turn. Jean-Philippe tried to convince Andrew to stay, suggesting that Ramsey might just be testing him. I don't know how many people which would be willing to be in your shoes. Andrew, though, wasn't interested in coming back and kicked his shoes off quite literally. They may take my shoes, Jake. I don't need this. I'm walking out these doors. His nonchalance, his soulless stares. Man, this was one of the most unpredictable moments ever. I was as shocked as JP there. Good God, what a guy. When I win this competition, I'm going to buy two walk-in coolers. That's all I really want. I hope he got those two walk-in coolers, although I dread to know what he would have done with them. Anyway, quickly moving on, we have Amber and her delusions of grandeur. Remember when she said, I've trained at the renowned Cordon Bleu in France, worked under a cadre of celebrity chefs, so naturally, everyone else pales in comparison. But hold your applause because maintaining such an ego trip is like the hallmark of immaturity, especially when her performance during the services were so inconsistent. So despite not being able to back up her talk, Amber couldn't quite come down from her pedestal. Now, let's rewind to the moment Amber had a full-blown meltdown, because Corey didn't pick her for the grand finale. It's just business, so it is what it is. When they discover the center of the universe, she is going to be so disappointed that she's not it. She just had to confront Corey that very night, as if it was a personal affront. Corey tried to explain it wasn't personal, but Amber sailed right over that explanation. She proceeded to gripe about Corey's decision to anyone within earshot, acting like it was doomsday. My feelings were hurt that she didn't call on me. If she didn't want me, then that's her loss. And even though she claimed to have moved on the next day, she simply couldn't resist giving Corey a hard time about it, all while making sure the world knew it was Corey's loss. Good gracious, Amber. She took pleasure in imagining Corey's impending suffering for not selecting her, but in reality, Corey dodged a bullet. I mean, not only did Amber forget to send out chicken with her entrees, but she also had the audacity to send raw chicken to the pass. When Mary Lou had to ask Cody to step in due to Amber's consistent blunders, guess what Amber had up her sleeve? Another flimsy excuse. It's just so annoying because it's like, boy toy to the rescue. When Amber was invited to join the blue team, her response? A downright surly attitude, naturally. Fast forward a bit, and when the blue team extended the olive branch, asking what was bothering her, her response was utterly baffling. I'm not into losing. What the 
This was especially puzzling since the blue team had clinched a victory the previous night and had been quite competitive in the challenges. They were far from a team of losers, but Amber couldn't seem to place any trust in her comrades. Speaking of trust, Amber had a knack for belittling others while inflating her own self-worth. They're ready to throw me off the boat with a brick tied to my leg and let me go under. Now, I get those Instagram-approved self-love quotes, okay, but... Amber had a knack for sweeping her own kitchen mishaps under the rug. I honestly just feel like at this point I should just keep my knowledge and my skills to myself. She openly mocked poor Nikki for her youth and acted as though Nikki couldn't possibly be qualified to be a sous chef, all while flaunting her own glorious resume. Like seriously, some people simply cannot get over themselves. Now watch this next chef's performance from season three and tell me what you think was wrong with her. This woman was stationed at the appetizer station. This was her moment to shine, her time to lead, or so she thought. But alas, her risotto turned out to be a salty disaster, forcing the entire team to hit the reset button. Not once, not twice, but thrice did she have to redo her risotto. Bravo, truly an inspiration in consistency. Ah, but wait, on her third attempt, Ramsey smelled something funny in the air. Turns out she had been using crab that had gone rancid. How can you do that? I didn't smell the crab. Sir. Look at Ramsey's eyes. He was genuinely horrified, and rightly so. That shit could have killed somebody. Everyone was utterly shocked. Like, this couldn't be just brushed off as careless. This was serious, you guys. We sent one out already. No, shall we? Thank have God for that. You'll kill someone. And just as you'd expect, she was kicked off her station immediately. Ramsey was so furious and disappointed. Something no. else. Recommend, yeah, recommend a new restaurant. Now, if you can't put a name to her face, that's okay. She was pretty forgettable, except for this teeny, tiny, lethal mistake. But just to do my due diligence, her name is Joanna, and I don't think she had any other notable moments on the show. But now, a lot of you might be expecting Raj's name to be on the list, but I mean it when I say that Raj might be one of the best contestants. Uh, hear me out. He hadn't done anything mean-spirited, despite the fact that his entire team made heartless, merciless comments towards him. Go home and stuff yourself with Twinkies so you have a f***ing heart attack on your recliner. Oh, so now you're gonna make fun of my weight. I'll admit, Trev crossed the line. It was uncalled for. The men made such ruthless attacks on the guy and with so much vitriol. You're attacking me, man. You're a waste of life. Here's some perspective, though. Taking a moment to stick his head into the cold, dark, walled freezer might seem unusual to some, but for Raj, it's a way to reduce sensory overload and find a sense of grounding. Raj's social interactions often appear awkward, and he faces challenges when it comes to understanding verbal instructions. It's not uncommon for him to ask for things to be repeated or interpret information in ways that were not intended. Given Raj's behavior on the show, some fans have speculated that he may be on the autism spectrum. There's no definitive way of knowing, but in light of this possibility, it's important for us to be sensitive and compassionate rather than to mock him. What's more is that today, he is a well-respected chef. Maybe he was just nervous about getting filmed all the time. So I have a pretty big problem with people who claim he's the worst contestant on the show when there are literally sexist, abusive ass who are even worse. What do you think? Was Raj being a psycho or was he just confused? Anyway, here's a special shout out to Elsie. But if we start talking about her, then we'd be here all day. So a story for another time. If you thought the news of the Battle of the Billionaires, Elon Musk and Mark Zuckerberg's cage match was intense, then you haven't seen some of these moments from Hell's Kitchen that were way more intense. Like this chef, who switched to boss mode right in the middle of deliberations. I'm seriously done. I am done. Oh yeah, you better believe that these were not empty threats. Well, he was really trying to dominate here, guys. So what happened is, the blue team had just lost the Indian cuisine challenge. Now I get it, losing the service can be a real downer, and it tends to stir up some intense emotions. But let me tell you, Bryant took those emotions to a whole new level. When the blue team was discussing who to eliminate, things got pretty heated between Bryant and Aaron and Sade. Things got so bad that it soon escalated into a fierce argument. Yo, bro. 
heated right now, dude. Yeah? Yeah. You. I don't know why you tonight. I'm talking to you. Dude, what's with the attitude, man? Now, I'm not sure what good came of this meltdown, but it did lead to some hilarious comments. Like, take a look at this one right here. Well, if you ask me, I think he did sound like he was trying to win a rap battle. Okay, so for those of you who have no clue what went down, Brian's first confronted Aaron, demanding to know why the guy didn't listen to him. Which is when Aaron, trying to explain himself, admitted that he wasn't as organized as Sade. But Brian's wasn't having any of it. He accused Aaron of being incapable of cooking and listening at the same time. No. Fuck you, fuck you, dude. Dude, I'm no. not you asking you. Can see what response. No. Meanwhile, Bryant's turned to Sade and suddenly thought of nominating her for elimination. But this led to another awkward argument. You see, Bryant really thought he was being intimidated. But you know what? Insecurity is loud. Confidence is silent. And in this moment, Sade definitely showed more dominance with her composed attitude and clever sarcasm, especially in contrast to Bryant's inability to keep himself together. In a fit of defiance, Bryant challenged the blue team to nominate him, boasting that he'd survive anyway. But Aaron hit back, saying that nobody with such a lousy attitude could ever be an executive chef. And after listening to something like that, Bryant wasn't one to back. Yeah, we're calm. I'm dominant more than you. That's why I'm standing. You're what? More dominant than you. Yeah, pretty cringe, man. It was quite embarrassing, honestly. And this whole thing even made him come across as immature and petulant. Although Bryant claimed that he was just talking to Aaron like a grown man, his behavior didn't seem to match up. Well, at least Bryant picked a fight with his teammates and not Chef Ramsay. Yeah. Something along those lines happened next on my list for today. Shut the f up and cook. Keep your mouth shut. Yes, chef, and cook. Don't talk, because he's only going to put his foot deeper. Yes! Totally, man. She's spot on. Nobody talks back to Ramsay. But someone had to learn her lesson the hard way. Siobhan thought her scallops looked just fine. But not even her own teammates believed her. Stop. Stop, will you? I thought they looked fine, chef. You thought they looked golden brown. They were black. Siobhan, however, was persistent. Or should I say delusion? Fine, Chef. So where's the fine ones then? They're right over Where here. Where are they? Where are they? Oh, girl, quit already. After seeing this, Ramsey didn't hold back from using his razor-sharp tongue. The damn thing was unseasoned and boiled beyond measure. And to top it all off, he had to bestow upon her the illustrious title of this. Get out! Get out! Get out! Get out! The punishment didn't end there, now did it? Ramsey actually commanded her to eat her mistakes in the dining room. Sadly, this whole ordeal proved to be Siobhan's undoing as she was eliminated that very episode. And you know what? I think she knew it already. However, this argument between Ramsey and Giovanni in season five is the stuff of legends. It is like the angriest version of the celebrity chef we've ever seen. Look at me, look at me, eyes! Not as pissed as I am! You donkey! No. The drama unfolded during a high stakes dinner service where Giovanni was holding down the meat station. But here's where things took a turn for the worse. Giovanni couldn't resist the temptation of constantly opening and closing the convection oven. Ramsey warned him that his actions might have consequences later and boy was he right. Giovanni's first blunder was sending up Ben Whaling's chicken special. But guess what? There was a raw drumstick on the plate. Yikes. He pleaded for one more minute to refire it, but it was pretty clear he had no clue how to make the dish in the first place. But Giovanni's attempts to redeem himself only resulted in a chewed up drumstick on the plate. I mean, why the hell did he even send that out? Chicken from the dog here. That's your special. Yeah. Ramsey was obviously not amused. He informed Ben that his special was being ruined because of Giovanni, and he even gave him quite the nickname in the heat of the moment. Ouch. Giovanni, of course, argued that he was not the said endearment, which of course only made Ramsey even more furious. Giovanni said this wasn't going to break him, and honestly, kudos to him for that. I would have probably crumbled. 
trying to get away with it. Now I'm ready for an argument. Sending me that. You should be ashamed. Uh, but yeah, he did really have a lot to be ashamed of that day. Which reminds me of this incident from the same episode. No idea. I have no idea. Hey, sure. come here, you. Hey. As you might remember, during the dinner service, Andrea was assigned to the garnish station. And unfortunately, she made a couple of crucial mistakes. To start off with, she started prepping her garnishes before the entrees were even ready. And to top it off, she cooked potatoes in a cold pan. And Ramsey wasn't too pleased and called her out on it. You can say Andrea was caught in a tough spot. On one hand, Ramsey kept yelling at her to speed up, but she knew that rushing could lead to a chaotic performance, which is exactly what happened. Andrea was so frustrated that she almost threw out the potatoes, but Ramsey intervened just in time. But things took a turn for the worse when Chef Ramsey called out the next order, and Andrea didn't respond. No answer. I'm not in the best of moods, huh? I That's don't like being ignored in my own kitchen. Yes, yes. What's going? Like he said, he clearly wasn't in the best of moods. And so, he asked her to repeat what he had just said, but she couldn't remember the details. I have no idea, Chef. Oh my god almighty. Girl, if only you paid attention! Robert, realizing the importance of the garnish station being ahead by 30 seconds, knew that they were in trouble if Andrea didn't know what the tickets called for. Meanwhile, Ramsey called her out for repeatedly not knowing what she was doing and asked the rest of the team to recite the order. Unfortunately, everyone stumbled over their words, which only added to Ramsey's frustration. And so what did our man have to do? He had to do something he absolutely hates, which is to call out the order again. But Andrea got it right this time. Right? Weirdly, she couldn't recite the order back accurately, and that was the last straw for Ramsey. So, what did he do next, you ask? Well, take a look at this. It seemed like she was ready to walk out through the front door, but Jean-Philippe stepped in and prevented her from leaving. Should he have maybe just let her leave? Well, I think that would have gone down as one of the craziest exits from the competition. But it's crazy how the charged up energy of the kitchen influences the customers as well. It's hilarious and hysterical how they wanted to boss around Ramsey. The first thing that comes to mind is obviously this one. Why is there no pumpkin in my risotto? Right, can you get out of the way? Want spaghetti, want risotto? Yes? Oh, are you gonna, always gonna be that rude and interrupt when I'm trying to talk? I just want more pumpkin, that's all I want. If Ramsey took a pause, it means he's absolutely gonna tear you apart. Pumpkin, I'll ram it right up your f***ing ass. Would you like it whole or diced? I bet the customer was feeling quite butthurt after this. But this customer totally deserved it. He was not only trying to interrupt the service, but also had the audacity to approach the kitchen. And Ramsey, as usual, has his own way of dealing with Karen. Okay, he heard you, ma'am. I think you made your point. And now would be a safe time to leave. But nope, she doesn't stop there. Chef! Right, don't whistle at me. I'm not your f***ing dog, yeah? You look more like a dog than I do. She went one step further and showed exactly how entitled she was. I can't believe she just did that. How dare she whistle at the great Ramsey? That's like, so degrading. What is he, your pet dog or something? Well, at least he doesn't beg for attention like you do. Keep barking up the wrong tree, you creep. And I can't help but bring up this one as well. A very honorable mention right here, guys. Buddy, hey, hey, about not, what kind of education right now, right now, right now, right now. Right now. Okay, so, sir, you're out of here. So he was a typical douche who not only ordered a pizza from an external restaurant to be delivered right to Chef Ramsay's domain, but assaulted his maitre d' as well. As if that wasn't enough, he then tried to justify his actions by claiming to hold a doctorate degree. But Jean-Philippe showed a lot of class and grace, reminding him that his degree doesn't make him educated. Do you have a doctorate? I do have an education. Do you have a doctorate? I guess this bully just wanted some screen time. And he got it all the same. So now I've gone over contestants, our man Ramsey, and even the customers in Jean-Philippe, all who lost it on the show. But this list is incomplete without mentioning this next moment. What are you doing? Get that tape off of there. And get the back in there. You think I'm stupid? Yep. 
Sous Chef Scott isn't one to be messed with, and he certainly isn't gullible. Remember how Andrew in season 1 got chewed out by him for trying to cheat his way out of a punishment? Season 1 was a long, long time ago, so if you don't remember this, here's a refresher. The night before the next dinner service in episode 6, Ramsay dropped a bombshell by announcing that both teams would be creating their own menus. It was time for some culinary creativity to shine. But things quickly got interesting on the blue team. Andrew suggested a braised salmon dish for their menu. However, Ralph, ever the opinionated teammate, shut down the idea. I've got my main. What are you thinking? It's a uh, braised salmon. I think I'm not big on salmon myself. I think halibut's great because I think people like halibut. Sensing a bit of a tiff, Andrew blamed Ralph when they lost the blind taste challenge as well, which led to their second punishment. Meanwhile, to stir things up, Ramsey locked their storeroom for the night, right where their precious baby chickens were kept, and gave them only one attempt to crack the combination lock. Finally, the blue team managed to crack the lock and retrieve their prized poultry. But leave it to Andrew to hatch a plan on the spot. He had Jessica hand him some masking tape to seal the latch. Unfortunately, sous chef Scott had his eagle eyes on them and caught Andrew red-handed. You guys yeah. fucked it up, you get a punishment. You don't f***ing rig it so it works for you. You blew it, pay the consequences, got it? Yeah, looks like Andrew's attempt to get the chicken out didn't work at all. But did any of you ever have a friendship that turned sour? Well, I can think of two or three guys from high school, but that was nothing like how these two friends quickly fell apart and turned on each other. I would admit to the sh You told me to run the fish. That's what my fish up the first time. How many of my steaks came back to Call was off. The alliance that started as a friendly bond in season 10 turned into an all-out war that had viewers reaching for the volume control thanks to an epic showdown between Kimmy and Robin. This battle was like a verbal explosion, complete with insults and name-calling. Child like no. it hit me! Hit me. Viewers were already taking sides, and I think they were mostly leaning towards Kimmy. According to this Reddit user, Kimmy rightfully called out the fact that Robin ignored her correct input on the food. Kimmy also said she acknowledges it was her fault for not being more assertive in her position. However, Robin wouldn't own up to her fault, and instead kept trying to egg Kimmy into a fight for selling her out to Ramsay. That's the reaction of a legit bully. Kimmy did get annoying, but that was only because she was defeated and emotional. But one thing I can't stand on a reality show is someone who creates drama intentionally or crosses over into bullying other contestants instead of looking inward. And look how things turned out. The same night of the fight, Kimmy was successful, and Robin had a shit service. One viewer also said how, aside from Christina, no one on the red team had any level of personal responsibility, accountability, or self-awareness. Well, that's certainly a point I completely agree with. So, whose side are you on? Let me know in the comments below. It's quite understandable that every contestant wants to put their best foot forward, but Jeff Lepoff thought he could go toe-to-toe -to -toe with Ramsey. Jeff, in all his audacity, decided to challenge his authority. He requested five minutes for the lamb, but Chef Ramsey wasn't having it. He reminded Jeff that he had asked for four minutes, and boy did that set Ramsey off. 30 customers not eating. Now Back on your section. Accusations were thrown, egos clashed, and Jeff's arrogance didn't exactly win him any points. Oh, really? Why? Because I'm not a quitter. You're not a quitter. <laughs> You're not a f cook either. In a moment of frustration, Jeff muttered the A word under his breath, and oh no, big boy, that was a huge mistake right there. Little did he know that sous chef Marianne had ears like a hawk. She caught wind of that insult and made sure Jeff paid the price for it. But when Ramsey summoned him, guess what Jeff did? I want to tell you, you're an asshole. That's not cool, Jeff. Unbelievable. That is not cool. People have red flags and there are those that have green flags. But Jeff chose to wave his white flag. Yep, he gave up. Now, we'll never know what Jeff's exit interview would have been like because it never made it to air. 
Viewers had differing opinions on this clash. While some thought Ramsey was being a bully, others thought he was just showing Jeff his place. There are also those who believe that Ramsey was responsible for killing his spirit. After all, the guy tried to pick himself up by saying he's not a quitter, but Gordon majorly slammed him down emotionally. The last thing you should do in an environment as charged as Hell's Kitchen is get angry. But these contestants didn't seem to get the memo. I didn't set it up, Chef. So Who I set it up. And they set it up. She can't cook asparagus. She snores and it keeps us all awake. These are the contestants who straight up betrayed their teammates. And how about starting things off with this contestant from the All Stars season? So it was the Italian night dinner service. Michelle was assigned to the meat station while Manda was in charge of preparing the pasta dishes. For those of you who didn't know, Manda has celiac disease, so she couldn't taste the pasta herself. And so she went for the next best thing and asked Michelle for her opinion instead. Michelle tasted Manda's pasta and nodded in approval, saying it was good. Taste that for me. Is that done? Mm. 30 more seconds. Okay. So far, so normal right? However, unknown to Manda, Michelle had ulterior motives. Ramsey tasted it and well, what do you know? The first batch of pasta returned to the kitchen undercooked. It looks like a lot, chef. It's no, just is taste raw. it. Just the taste it. Is raw. It's crunchy as Manda was puzzled because she trusted Michelle's judgment. Michelle, on the other hand... I can tell when pasta's done just by looking at it, so Manda should be able to do it too. So were you blind while checking Manda's dish? Or, uh, what do you call not being able to taste? Anyway, Manda made a second attempt in hopes of getting it right this time. But as if she learned absolutely nothing, she sought Michelle's opinion again. Michelle, in turn, claimed the pasta was fine. Again. I need a mouth. Here, Michelle. It's done. Michelle says the is done. But thanks to Elise, it was revealed that the pasta was still raw. And you wouldn't believe how nonchalant Michelle was about the whole thing. Yeah, thanks, Michelle. My bad. The first time I could excuse as an honest mistake. But twice? Nah, I don't think so. And she was so unapologetic about it. Michelle was fooling no one. Viewers saw right through it, and Manda also realized that she was being misled. Good job. Me twice now. Well, at least she didn't go in for a third round of punishment. But here comes one of the most unworthy winners of HK, Ariel Malone of season 15. And her betrayal during the second service was deviously underhanded. Two snapper, three chicken, I'm dying. That's gonna be five to the window shot. What's wrong with the snapper? While Mia stepped away for a moment, Ariel pounced on the opportunity, snatching her snapper and serving it up raw. We never said it was ready. Ariel come and grab it and took it up. There. Oh my God, seriously. Ramsey's always watching, even in the dorms. And what better way to express that than having Ramsey at his worst on the wall? A little reminder that Gordon's always watching. Yep, in the midst of all the luxury, you better not forget who the real boss is. Where's the lamb sauce? Well, Ramsey might be the boss, no doubt. You look like a female version of f***ing Hannibal Lecter. Put your f***ing tongue in and concentrate. Quite the description, huh? And that tongue lashing you just heard was directed towards Sharon from season four. So what happened is, during the signature dish challenge, Sharon presented something that ultimately didn't meet the high standards of the competition. And Ramsey didn't hold back in letting her know. You know damn well that isn't up to scratch for Hell's Kitchen. Her first service in the kitchen only added to her troubles. Ramsey called her out for an unseasoned risotto, something it's always the seasoning, and when asked to taste her own dish, she couldn't see the issue. Oh, come on, Sharon. It's like rice pudding. Instead of taking responsibility, Sharon attempted to shift some of the blame onto her teammates. That's not just my fault, and it's too bad that Chef Ramsay didn't see that. Later, in a bid to redeem herself, she ended up preparing more risotto than needed, which only confused matters and discouraged Ramsay further. Which one are you cooking? This one. Whose is this one? I don't know, I'll get rid of it. Oh, come on, Sharon. The final blow came when her refire, intended to be an improvement, was rejected because of an overwhelming <laughs> amount of garlic. Sharon, enough's enough. 
I'm going to put some more makeup on. I mean, I always add more garlic than it says to on the recipe, but there are limits. Yeah, she was removed from her station right then and there. However, during prep before the second service, her confusion over the recipes led Corey to step in and guide her through the tasks, which didn't sit well with the team. Our team has a problem right now just worth sharing. It puts us at a really big disadvantage. And things didn't improve during dinner service when Sharon was assigned to the meat station. Ramsey quickly noticed that she had placed cooked meat near raw meat, something that we know all too well from Kitchen Nightmares that is never a good idea. And as the service continued, Sharon's struggles persisted. She forgot to send out a beef dish, causing further delay and frustration. When Ramsey tried to see if she was communicating with Christina, her response was... Well, it wasn't a response, actually. It was more like nonsensical blabbering. No, I did it. I did it early. I thought it was coming. She just yelled it was coming. Assuming Christina would be ready, she didn't bother communicating, leading Ramsey to bestow upon her a title for the ages. You're not really a chef, are you? You're just a showgirl with a big feather coming out your ass. Man, you think you've heard it all. But the breaking point came when a halibut dish prepared by Jason was sent back and Ramsey accused Sharon of slowing down the entire operation. In response to the mounting issues, Ramsey made the difficult decision to shut down the restaurant. By this point, Sharon's inexperience and inability to handle the pressure of Hell's Kitchen had become glaringly evident, ultimately leading to her downfall in the competition. Surprisingly, she wasn't nominated for elimination by Corey. However, Ramsey decided to make a tough call. Two services. You haven't convinced me that you can cook. He chose to eliminate Sharon outright, citing her consecutive poor performances. But Sharon wasn't convinced. I don't think Gordon liked me from the start. He just had the wrong image of me. Well, she didn't have the skill, but she sure had the confidence. I mean, hold up on that. We need the salmon and the tagliatelle first before anything else. Dude, I can't wait. Ignoring even more advice from Gail, she was hell-bent on sending out her Wellingtons early. I just spent like 20 minutes cooking all this, letting it rest, doing it right, you know? As if that was gonna go well. Why are you throwing them under the bus? I'm not sure. What can I do with it? Nothing, Chef. Oh, God. I think she totally deserved being up for elimination that night. You are quite frankly the most selfish cook in here. Ramsey's justified criticism didn't phase Sabrina. Instead, she stubbornly defended herself during the plea, indirectly pointing the finger at Lisa's age. She's spent, Chef. You know, I'm young. The world is my what oyster. I'm Just spent. Me. Spent. Spent. Uh-huh, that's definitely the problem here. Instead of reflecting on her own actions, she took yet another low blow at Nona, attempting to discredit her with even more petty and irrelevant excuses. Her idea of fine dining is fried chicken, chef. She can't cook asparagus, she snores, and it keeps us all awake. Like, hold on for a minute. Is she for real? Sabrina's attempt to manipulate the elimination by bringing personal issues to the forefront not only showcased her lack of professionalism, but also highlighted her her willingness to betray a teammate by playing dirty in a competition that should have been about culinary skill, not personal vendettas. During the Italian night service, Sabrina's behavior towards Gail was yet another serious letdown. She was in charge of the grill, but struggled big time with timing, leaving Ramsey and her entire team in the dark. Um, chef, my pork. Just give me a fucking time! Okay, four minutes! Gail attempted to coordinate with Sabrina in spite of it all, but the inconsistent timing threw her off. How long on the second pork, Sabrina? Probably about seven, eight minutes. No, I don't trust Sabrina at all. She doesn't know her timing. Then, in a move that reeked of betrayal, she knowingly sent her dish out. Even though Gail wasn't ready with her pasta, she told her to wait. We're waiting for the pasta now. It just makes Gail look bad. <laughs> and yeah, everybody heard that. Yeah, it was a deliberate move to make Gail look bad. Plain and simple. Everybody thinks that I'm stupid, but you know what? I'm one manipulative girl. Sabrina's actions were downright underhanded. Her confession painted her as someone who prioritized herself over the team as a collective. And honestly, who would want to work with someone like that? Instead of focusing on her own strengths during the elimination plea, she chose the path of least integrity. 
She was more concerned about pointing out others' weaknesses and throwing even more lame excuses out left and right. When it was her turn to speak up, Sabrina attempted to justify her spot by exaggerating her supposedly good performances, all the while conveniently using her inexperience as a safety net. Who would you rather have work for you? Somebody who has a title of an executive chef or somebody who hasn't been doing it this long? But Ramsey wasn't having any of it. He called her out, absolutely destroying her for using her inexperience as an excuse. Don't use that inexperience excuse on me ever again. Yeah, sure. Yeah, that was never gonna work. And by the way, this was something he made abundantly clear in previous seasons. I don't give two f about how much experience you've got. What I do care about is who has the magic, who has it. Sabrina's pleas throughout the entire season were a disaster. Her over-the-top drama and all-too-common deflection absolutely stunk of immaturity and a lack of accountability. Instead of, you know, showing genuine passion or a willingness to learn from mistakes, she relied on empty excuses and pointed fingers. A hell of an unfortunate duo, if I've ever seen one. Now, let's talk about the time when Zacky pulled the wackiest move on Ray in season 11. You see, right from the prep phase before the 11th service, when Ray offered his help, Zack blatantly ignored him, causing frustration among his teammates, including Anthony, who wasn't happy about Zack's sluggishness. Let's go, Zack. Can't be dragging ass. He needs to snap the hell out of it. Yeah, blatant disregard for teamwork and camaraderie. During the private dinner service, Zack's attempt to assist Ray on plating ended disastrously. Ramsey and Ray noticed Zack's sloppy plate with minimal pasta and no lobster. Hey, Zack, look at that, and look at that. There's no lobster in there, Zack. But you should be leaving this then. Tell it! This frustrated Ray, who rightfully questioned Zack's commitment, leading to a heated exchange. Zack, do me a favor. Fuck off, please. Take it over here. You're killing me. You're killing me. Try to throw me right, under the bus. During a refire, Ray requested him to finish cooking the lobster in butter. Zack retaliated by sabotaging it cooking it in a cold sauce instead. Earlier, Chef Ray tells me to f off. And now I'm definitely gonna get revenge. I'm trying to sabotage him. Yeah, quite openly at that. Hey, come here, just touch that. It's cold! Ray, it's cold! This sabotage not only angered Ramsey, who obviously rejected the cold lobster, but also incited Ray's fury towards Zack for undermining the entire team. Later, when leading the New York strip course, Zach seemed really disinterested when John was asking about the sauce. Zach, where's your sauce at? Why can't he talk? Yeah. Ramsey saw that the steaks weren't being seasoned like the red teams from a mile away, which sparked a confrontation, with Zach clumsily trying to defend himself and Ramsey accusing him of lying. We seasoned on this. No, are no, you lying? You did not slice it and season it. <sighs> it's always the seasoning, isn't it? And he really thought he could fool Ramsey. Go ahead and add his name to the list of the hundreds that came before him who've tried and failed. But in short, Zack's betrayal showed a complete lack of respect and teamwork. His actions not only disrupted service, but disrespected the hell out of his teammates, especially Ray. I'm so f pissed at Zack. I'm like, dude, you just, you f me. But with all that being said, I really have no idea how this happened. Ray, please give me your jacket. Sure. Ray often faces rightful criticism for his performance, but his elimination that night in favor of keeping Zack around was utterly absurd. Ramsey caught Zack red-handed, deliberately trying to sabotage Ray. Yet Ray got sent home over him? Gotta say, Ramsey, I do not understand the logic here. Unless you're looking for a deceitful head chef? Moving on, let's look at what happened during season 16's third service. During prep, she refused to communicate and openly stated that she wasn't in the mood to work, which really got under Aziza, Wendy, and Heather's skin. I just doing a whole lot of nothing. We're watching it the whole time. This lack of commitment and effort set a negative tone right from the start. What you working on? I don't know. I'm not in a mood right now. That's very lacy of her, pun intended. During dinner service, Gia's performance at the meat station was marred by inconsistencies and questionable actions. While her first attempt at the lamb was acceptable, her next one was overcooked. It's like 
veal is overcooked. Hello, an absolute meltdown. Her refire attempts were no better, culminating in Ramsay's shock at her Wellingtons being horrendously sliced. I've never ever in the history of Hell's Kitchen been given a Wellington not even, not even sliced. Oh, and he wasn't done. It's like some bad from the woods, the most expensive cut anywhere in the world. I look at the way it's dumped. Who gave me this? What followed was a feeble attempt to excuse her blunder by claiming she nearly cut her finger off, prompting Ramsey to call for medical assistance. Sorry, I cut my finger off, Chef. You cut your finger off? Yes. Show me. So get the medic. Medic! However, Ramsey's attempt to verify her injury exposed Gia's ruse. Despite her claims of a near finger amputation, there was no visible cut or any blood on her finger at all. Where's the cut? Where's the cut? Right here. Where? It's not there. So she wanted an easy way out. The red team lost the service, and during deliberations, this happened. But who's volunteering themselves to go up tonight? I'll do it. I'll do it. I Eventually, Jen volunteered, and Gia was nominated. <laughs> I'm not an arguer. I hate arguing. I lived with that in my family, and I just don't like it. But Jessica's plea for staying in Hell's Kitchen really shed light on her personal struggles. She admitted to nominating herself out of a deep-rooted fear of arguments, a trauma rooted in her past experiences of growing up in a household filled with constant conflict. This revelation hinted at a potential battle with PTSD resulting from her dysfunctional family environment. It seems that her coping mechanism involved avoiding disputes, making her self-nomination a means to dodge future potential conflicts within the team. On the flip side, here's what Gia said. Anytime I'm in the kitchen, I'm working hard, always ready to help one of my teammates. I don't never come in here with an attitude. Hey, you know you were being recorded, right? We saw you stand and give up on your team during prep because, oh, not in the mood. But wait, she had more to add. She's already packed. I'm not packed. I'm ready to stay here. This move to spill dorm secrets to Ramsey didn't earn her any popularity points. She was seen as a rat for not upholding team solidarity. Jessica, you've packed. You are not ready to head to Vegas. Despite Ramsey's earlier stance on dorm issues, meaning he clearly said that he didn't care about what goes on in the dorms, his choice to ax Jessica over Gia's betrayal seemed unjust and went against his own stated policy. I guess what I'm trying to say is that these events brought Ramsey's fairness into question. Jessica's struggles and her coping mechanism should have been considered more empathetically especially since her performance wasn't notably worse than Gia's. I genuinely couldn't grasp what Ramsey saw in Gia. To me, it seemed like one of the most straightforward decisions on the show to eliminate her. However, instead of Gia leaving, Jessica went home instead. Sure, Jessica's mistake in packing was bad, but she only messed up one plate throughout that whole service. Her other services showed improvement, either performing well or bouncing back after a slip-up. On the other hand, Gia lied about her finger injury and completely messed up the meat. I mean, come on, it's night and day. But I'm curious what your take on all of this is. Meanwhile, let me hop over to the next topic. Now, in Season 9, following a challenging service, Ramsey tasked the final five chefs with a crucial decision nominating two individuals for elimination. Elise orchestrated a calculated move. She individually approached both Will and Paul, artfully persuading them to consider Jennifer as the weakest link among the remaining chefs. I have asked you for a favor. When I go up there, I'm gonna put Jennifer as the weakest because she is. Typical high school shit. Just say that in front of everyone. Why the backhandedness? She was only looking out for herself by pitting the others against Jennifer like that. I'm being diplomatic and I'm asking you to look out for me because I will look out for you. I know you're better than me. God, how low was she willing to go? But Jennifer was wise to Elise's sly tactics. Confident in her own abilities and considering herself superior to Elise in various aspects, she hoped that Paul and Will would see through Elise's manipulation. After all the she's put us through, Will and Paul are smart enough not to fall for Elise's One can only hope. The deliberation turned into a tense chess game as Ramsey probed the chefs for their nominations. Who is the weakest chef? Come on, man, it's an easy answer. 
But Paul struggled to make a definitive choice first, prompting Will to abruptly lend his support to Elise as the stronger chef. Much to Jennifer's, and frankly my, disbelief. Solely based on cooking, chef? Uh, Pure I, cooking! I think Elise is a stronger cook than Jennifer. Is. It was tough to watch. Eventually, Paul sided with Elise as being the stronger cook, too. Who's the worst cook? Jennifer Chef. You Thank are you. Kidding me. I'm, just, I'm being honest. At least Tommy didn't give in to the pressure and did the right thing by saying that Elise was the weakest link. This sequence of events culminated in the heartbreaking elimination of Jennifer. Despite her undeniable talent and consistent performance throughout the competition, the strategic manipulation orchestrated by Elise and the wavering decisions of her fellow contestants led to Jennifer's unjust departure. I can't believe you two would actually sit here and say, that she is better than me. I am. And fans weren't happy. Everyone agreed that Jennifer should have stayed instead. And I mean, hear, here. Will and Paul were manipulated to backstab Jennifer, but it's not like they didn't have any personal motive in this. Jennifer was obviously the better chef and therefore the biggest threat. At least Tommy had integrity and wanted to have an equal fight in the end. What do you think? Be sure to drop your thoughts in the comments below. I'm genuinely curious. And if you enjoyed this video, make sure to drop a like, subscribe, and turn on my post notifications. And if you thought this video was crazy, make sure to check out the next one right here. It's even better.